Hello and welcome. I am Gildardo Martinez. Together with my colleagues Brett Kinsella and Benjamin Kopinski, we will explore the history, use, and importance of the development of the cloud chamber. First, I want to begin with the origin and history of the cloud chamber. The diffusion cloud chamber is a scientific instrument used to detect ionizing radiation. The physicist Charles Thompson Reese Wilson invented the first cloud chamber in 1911. It was called an expansion chamber. It was limited by its inability to run continuously, and the design was further improved by Alexander Langsdorff, who developed the diffusion cloud chamber in 1936. Unlike traditional cloud chambers, which use a pressure differential to supersaturate vapor, the diffusion cloud chamber uses a temperature differential. This allows the chamber to operate continuously and to detect a broader range of ionizing particles, including those produced by terrestrial sources, such as radioactive decay. The diffusion cloud chamber has been used in various research settings, including high energy physics and particle astrophysics. A cloud chamber is a device that allows for the visualization of the tracks of charged particles, such as alpha particles and electrons, as they pass through a gas or vapor. It is composed of a sealed environment with a warm top plate and a cold bottom plate, as well as a source of liquid alcohol in a heated reservoir. As the alcohol vaporizes and cools, it falls through the gas and condenses on the cold bottom plate. The principles of ionization and condensation play a significant role in the physics of a cloud chamber. Ionization is the process in which a neutral atom or molecule becomes a charged particle or ion after gaining or losing an electron. When a charged particle travels through a material, it can ionize the atoms or molecules it encounters, creating a trail of ions. In a cloud chamber, the charged particles are often alpha particles or electrons which are emitted by radioactive substances like thorium-232, a naturally occurring radioactive metal that is primarily an alpha particle emitter. During its decay process, thorium-232 undergoes a series of nuclear transformations to eventually become stable lead. As it decays, it emits various types of ionizing radiation such as alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. It's important to note that the rate at which thorium decays is very slow, with a half-life of about 14 billion years. However, the ionizing radi radiation emitted during the decay process can be harmful to living organisms if they're exposed to high levels of it. Condensation is the process by which a gas or vapor becomes liquid. When a gas or vapor is cooled or comes into contact with a surface that is cooler than its dew point, it can condense into a liquid. In a cloud chamber, the vapor is kept at a temperature just below the point of condensation so that it is super saturated. This means that it is saturated with more vapor than it can normally hold at a given temperature. When a charged particle passes through the chamber and ionizes the vapor, it creates a trail of ions that can act as nucleation sites, causing the vapor to condense into droplets and form visible tracks. These tracks can be used to study the properties of the charged particles and, and the interactions they have with matter. The diffusion cloud chamber that we built is composed of four main parts. The chamber itself, the lighting apparatus, the evaporation reservoirs, and the insulated base. The chamber is a 14 by 14 inch cube with quarter inch acrylic on the four sidewalls and lid, whereas the base is a piece of black anodized aluminum that was selected to reduce unwanted glare from the LED arrays and assist in the transfer of cold produced from below. All of these pieces, excluding the lid, were bonded together using silicone in order to introduce flexibility into the system as it was concluded that the walls of the chamber may shift with the extreme thermal gradient that was necessary to produce a working system. The lighting apparatus is composed of two arrays of green Cree LEDs wired in series and run at 24 volts DC with a 700 milliamp constant current regulator to avoid thermal runaway. Each array consists of eight LEDs, and each LED is fashioned with a small plastic lens glued to it using a UV-activated adhesive to reduce the angle of dispersion that the LEDs produce. Each array produces a significant amount of heat and is mounted to a rectangular piece of aluminum with small finned heat sinks mounted to the back using the aforementioned adhesive to help regulate the temperature of the LEDs. The evaporation reservoirs are a 12 by three by two inch pencil organizer made out of tin that have had the paint removed from the bottom of them to allow for the improved thermal transfer from the heating elements and are mounted to the side of the chamber using a clear epoxy. 
Each evaporation reservoir has four polyamide film heaters mounted to the bottom of them and are wired in series, independent of each other. One heating element array is run at around 36 volts CC via a variable output power supply, while the other is run at around 40 volts DC via a rechargeable battery. The base of the system is constructed of painted plywood with a reflective insulating layer applied to one side of the wood. However, the primary insulation comes from the two inch thick rigid foam insulation that lines the inside of the wooden base. This insulation was cut with a square hole in the middle of it to allow for the cloud chamber to sink into the base and has six aluminum L bracket pieces resting on top of the hole to assist in the transfer of the cold produced from the dry ice. The procedures to run the cloud chamber are fairly simple and start with cleaning the inside of the chamber using isopropyl alcohol to remove any dust or foreign material that may have accumulated. The next step is to fill the base of the cloud chamber with a fairly large amount of dry ice to ensure that the chamber cools sufficiently before placing the acrylic chamber on top. Then the reservoirs are filled about a third of the way with isopropyl alcohol and a thin layer of isopropyl is dispersed on the bottom of the chamber to reduce glare. At this point, the chamber can be sealed using the lid and the heaters can be turned on, which will start to evaporate the isopropyl. The goal is to create a metastable, supersaturated layer of isopropyl vapor that will allow for the detection of both terrestrial and cosmic radiation. If terrestrial radiation, such as nuclear decay, is the detection target, then a radioactive object such as a thoriated tungsten electrode can be put into the chamber to visualize the nuclear decay emissions. While we were able to get the chamber to detect both cosmic and terrestrial radiation, it unfortunately produces extremely inconsistent results and often only works for less than a few minutes at a time. This led us to coming up with multiple hypotheses and testing those ideas to see if we could produce more consistent results. Our first hypothesis was that the cloud was not dense enough. In an attempt to jumpstart the cloud formation, we preheated the alcohol. This resulted in a larger and denser cloud, but still no supersaturated layer was visible. Our second hypothesis was that the evaporation system was causing an uneven temperature gradient. To run both heaters, we had to jerry-rig a battery and were running them at different voltages. When we tried to fix this, we got a second power supply and ran them both at the same voltage. We did get some condensation trails, but it was not consistent. Our third hypothesis was that the dry ice was not making sufficient contact with the aluminum base and therefore not dropping the temperature low enough. We attempted to fix this by lowering the cloud chamber to induce better contact with the ice, but this resulted in no change as well. The bottom plate was cold enough to burn on contact, but no trails were detected. Our fourth hypothesis was that there was dust particles within the chamber that were unwanted condensation nuclei and not allowing the supersaturated cloud to form. We've added a vacuum mechanism to the chamber to clear any unwanted dust particles. We also tried creating a small scale in a jar, leaving it sit for hours and inducing static electricity. We were left stumped as none of the changes we made to the chamber resulted in improved detection consistency. This led us to purchasing a couple of Adreno sensors that record temperature, humidity, and pressure as a last ditch effort to see if we could detect any anomalies. In doing so, we discovered that the temperature gradient we were producing was likely insufficient. The sensor that was roughly three quarters of an inch above the bottom of the chamber recorded a low of 19 degrees Fahrenheit, and the closest sensor to the top of the chamber recorded a high of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. We concluded that these readings are simply not extreme enough to produce consistent detections given that our chamber is 14 inches tall and others online created extremely consistent readings with similar temperatures but with much shorter chambers. If we could go back and build the chamber again from scratch, we'd do so with a height of 8 inches or less, as that seems to be where most configurations that produce optimal results lie. All in all, it was a great learning experience building this instrument, and we'd like to extend our thanks to those that have supported us through this process. I hope you learned something, and if you're going to create a cloud chamber in the future, hopefully you can build an arm of states and build an amazing device. Thanks for watching.